spring 2023 brought in a number of anime from all genres for people to view and love. Science fiction was no exception, with Dr. Stone returning for its third season. However, there was a new sci-fi anime that was about to take the community and related discussion boards by storm. And man, is it wacky. Heavenly Delusion loves to mess with the person viewing it. It likes jumping around with opposing ideas to make you question what the hell is going on no matter what the episode is. This super advanced world is actually a post-apocalyptic wasteland. This chick is a guy and that guy is a chick. It's a show that rewards you for using your brain and while it's not particularly difficult to unravel some of the things that it displays, if the viewer is trying to watch without thinking, they will most definitely get left behind. I found myself just completely forgetting details and after going back and rewatching some bits i got even more into the show like i completely forgot that mario was meant to stick the person who looks like him with the syringe when you watch the first episode you pretty much assume it would be tokyo but then you eventually learn that timelines aren't the same so it takes until it's shown that maru has a a, a twin a clone or whatever it actually is probably a clone but the story takes what you think you know throws it away and then eventually ties it all back together paying attention to the details is extremely important speaking of details let's take a look at the details of how this anime just does things differently Heavenly Delusion does character work in a bit of an interesting way. Really, outside of Maru, there isn't a lot of growth on a purely individual level. However, where the writing shines in this regard is the dynamics between the characters and how they interact with the world around them. Starting with the obvious one, the dynamic between Maru and Kiriko is the driving force behind their side of the story. There isn't quite as much intrigue with the world when following them after you learn the general basics of what's going on, but watching them navigate said world is fascinating enough. Their roles are supposedly that of bodyguards and the one being escorted, though they don't really slot into those roles. If you were to show two people these characters and ask which one the bodyguard was, they'd probably struggle to answer the question in the early episodes, and would probably guess the wrong person later on. We aren't meant to get caught up in any specifics about what they're doing, it's all about how they navigate the situations they're in. When fighting the first man-eater we encounter in the series, the pair tries to take it out in a more conventional style to start off, using the gun that was shown in the first episode, which ended up as a failure, and only then do they switch switch up to the more dangerous option of having Maru use his ability. They're both understanding enough to realize that the more dangerous option sometimes might be the only option. There's no dramatic speech from Kiriko about how Maru shouldn't risk it and how she needs to do something as the bodyguard. Maru and Kiriko trust one another and respect each other's strengths. This trust only builds as they continue through the episodes. Really in every single mini arc that occurs in the show that follows Maru and Kiriko ends up deepening their trust in some capacity. Of course we just mentioned the first bit there, but something always tends to happen. The first and only person that Kiriko has told about having the brain of a male switch to a girl's body was Maru. It's a tragic past they would obviously want to keep away, so it says a lot that Kiriko opened up about it. One of their most important moments comes in episode 8, where the duo agrees to help Dr. Usami. It's a much different episode in regards to the pacing, and is probably my personal favorite episode of the season. Helping to put down the dying girl in a manner that would allow her to avoid turning into a man-eater is something that had an effect on Maru, though he probably didn't realize how deep it cut when he did it. That would come to light a short bit later in the episode when the doctor takes his own life, having lost the person he cared about most. It's rare to ever see Maru upset as he's usually rather optimistic, but the situation leads him to question his own character. His ability to kill is pretty much unrivaled. He can take out man-eaters without breaking a sweat, and he's an enigma in terms of normal human strength as well. His strengths make killing easier, but Maru questions his own sense of self through that. Is killing all he's good for? Kiriko of course steps in to tell him that he's more than just that, and it's a bittersweet moment that marks the fact that both of them have now shown their insecurities to each other, and a sign of a pretty great friendship. In relation to this episode, I want to shift over to our second set of characters that reside in heaven. While there are some characters that have a duo bond similar to Maru and Kiriko, I'd argue that the character development from the kids in the facility actually comes from how their relationship with that facility itself evolves. It's pretty clear to the viewer from the get-go that something isn't quite right in this place, and even for those who didn't notice, the ominous messaging during Tokyo's test surely put them on the right path. The control that the adults have over the kids continuously slips away as the episodes pass. It's simple at first, with some of the children learning that there is an outside beyond the facility, but that was just the top of the slippery slope. All the children 
children have some sort of unique special ability, and this unpredictability allows for them to further gain a sense of independence. Cuckoo's frog powers let her scale up a wall into a vent, which on its own would be detectable, but much like Tokyo's test being interfered with, something or someone is covering for them. Now, being able to see these weird baby things doesn't really mean much in the general sense. It mainly serves as a piece of information for the audience, but it is still a step in the direction of independence for these kids. They're starting to break rules, and one thing will lead to another as time goes on. The adults had also made it a point not to teach them anything about love, but you can see some of them experimenting, and while I can't show the scene because I don't want this video to get nuked, whoever is trying, for lack of better way of putting it, to corrupt these kids also tries to push them in that direction. This not only culminates in Tokyo's relationship with Kona, which leads to her pregnancy, but also leads to one of the more touching character stories that we see from the facility group. The story of Mimihime and Shiro's relationship is a bit of an odd one for the most part. It starts pretty normal, but then of course we get, you know. At that point, the viewer probably doesn't know much of what to think about them, but seeing Shiro freak out over simply getting hugged was pretty funny and shows just how sheltered they really are. The series then takes a bit more of an unconventional route by actually showing us the end of their story in episode 8 in present time. Like I said earlier, this is a personal favorite episode, and the emotional weight is already pretty intense, but the designs of the characters, the fact that one is infected with the black spots, which we'll get to later, and the button design by the end of the episode, one should be able to infer that these two characters are in fact Mimihime and Shiro. It's a tragic end of things, but a hopeful takeaway that you can have is that they were able to die as they wanted. Mimihime as a human, and Shiro with the person he loved in his arms. This moment basically transfers the bulk of its emotional weight to the finale of the series where we actually get to see a very raw love confession from Shiro. I really do adore this scene because it's just such an in-character way to do it. He doesn't really understand the emotion of love, but he feels a rush of emotion specifically for Mimihime, and so he's fine putting those emotions under that metaphorical umbrella, to which she accepts by giving the uniform button to him. Even if this is a way of character writing that is a bit out of the box, I think it's effective and creates a much different watching experience. So with character out of the way, let's move on. The world of Heavenly Delusion is as wild as it gets, mainly due to the multiple timelines and multitude of perspectives that we're following. Now, the series is an urban fantasy sci-fi type of thing as opposed to something like an Isekai where the world is just entirely different, so there's only so much that the series can add, but what it does allows for the world to be fleshed out while not straying too far from the realistic side of things. Heavenly Delusion branches out in basically only two ways from our modern world. The first having the far more advanced technology, and the second being the powers that the children have, which in turn also leads to the Hiroko existing. Despite the low quantity of differences, the quality makes up for it. The increase in technological prowess makes for an interesting world due to the dual perspectives of the show, one showing that technology at its absolute peak, and the other showing the leftovers of what once was, making for a more diverse apocalyptic wasteland. Kuruko having the laser gun, for example, makes for a more varied way of exploration, but as powerful as it is, it's still held back by the difficulty of finding a way to charge the battery on a consistent basis, and sometimes the gun just straight up doesn't shoot a fourth time. Most importantly, that advanced tech allowed for the brain transplant to occur. That detail is the foundation by which Kiriko's character is built on, the difficulty in understanding their own identity, as well as the reason for their adventure with Maru. On to the role that the Hiroko play, and I'm going to try and keep it simple because I feel like I could go on forever about how they fit into the world. Unless you weren't paying attention, it should be obvious that the man-eaters were all children from the facility, and their powers transferred over to their monster form. The first one we can really deduce was Cuckoo as the fish with the arm-leg things. Kona gave her the picture of it, and it's extremely similar to her ability, though there were some differences in how it seemed to work, but it's close enough. The episode name was also Cuckoo, so, you know, could be a coincidence, but I probably bet not. In that same episode though, we got to see something I mentioned earlier in the video with the black spotted disease. By that point, we hadn't really known what it was, but episode 8's situation with Mimihime helped to fill in the blanks. Even by the end of the season, we don't really understand what the disease is or why it happens, but the fun thing with that is not even the adults really understand it. Probably has a lot to do with the great disaster that is talked about on occasion, but we don't really know anything about it other than it will turn those children with powers into Hiroko. It's quite nice to 
to not get a full, drawn-out explanation for things that the characters would already know. A strength that Heavenly Delusion displays often is the ability to show and not tell, but even when it does tell, it tends to do it for a reason. Not that telling is inherently a bad thing like everyone usually treats it like the boogeyman or something, but it can be a difficult thing to incorporate effectively if you aren't careful when writing. And since Heavenly Delusion takes place 15 years after the disaster, it would be very difficult to ever find someone that would actually need an explanation to most things, or really anything else in the world. An instance of telling actually being effective would be in the first episode where the innkeeper mentions a monster being on the premise, and our duo both asked to confirm what she's actually talking about, because people call them Hiroko or Maneater, all sorts of different things. Kind of like The Walking Dead where they call them a variety of names like walkers or biters, since the universe of The Walking Dead is one where zombie culture didn't exist. You'd think it'd be an overall insignificant detail, but it does come back around later when Kiriko and Maru investigate that little 100% safe water place, and they were warned about a, quote, monster. They assume that monster is just another man-eater, but when Maru goes to deal with it, they quickly realize the fact that that bear is just a bear, and he cannot use his ability on it. The situation that unfolds is pretty comedic, but it goes to show that confirming what the innkeeper was talking about wasn't just a lazy thing of writing to show that man-eaters exist, but a bit of world building that comes back later. It ain't much, but it's honest work. Anyway, getting back uh, on track a bit, not every time a Hiroko appears will we actually know who it is. In episode 7, we do see Omo when Kiriko is put into that hallucination, fitting that she is with Shiro and Mimihime, though in episode 10 they fight against a freezing base one that we don't really know the origin of. Or we do, and I'm stupid and wrong, that's also the thing. Episode 10 does let us know that these powers are genetic and can be passed down, however. Juichi's lover was someone who used to be in a facility, and during the Collapse era eventually had a child with him. The ice powers passing down raises the question of how the disease might impact the offspring of the Heaven Test subjects, probably the same as the parents, but until we see something we could really only assume. Even outside of the story important bits, the world of Heavenly Delusion has some interesting things to look at, just from a background perspective perspective. Pod racing, I, I mean kart racing, has absolutely nothing to the story, but it's a part of the world anyway. People are trying to move past the idea that they're living in a much worse off world than before by just finding a way to entertain themselves. Entire places around the country exist as if they're in their own little world. The tomato heaven that they run across in episode 2 is just a little thriving community that even has a trade route established across water with Tokyo. These details serve to differentiate Heavenly Delusion from other apocalypse-based shows. Most of them are just all sort of the same. There's some good camps and bad camps out in the world, and sometimes they fight, but otherwise they just sort of exist. Giving some personality to different locations in the world will keep viewers interested whenever they enter a new location. It really is just a fun, lively world. Well, not, not fun, but you know, you know what I mean. Now, I don't really have an insane amount to say here, but I do think that the direction of Heavenly Delusion adds to its unique feel. Rarely do two episodes ever really feel the same, both in content and how they are produced. Sometimes you'll get a slower episode just going through the world and gathering information, sometimes it'll be a fast-paced, action-packed episode, throw in a somber episode with slow but impactful pacing, and then just two episodes later start off with a comedy that devolves into a bittersweet ending that our duo isn't even aware of themselves. Hero Jessica Mori, the director, along with all the episode directors, deserve a considerable amount of praise for how they handled the content, making something that would have felt fresh regardless feel even better due to just how they put so much love into it. According to some leaks, we've already got a season 2 on the way at some point in the distant future, and if that's true, I will for sure be watching. Heavenly Delusion is certainly a show that almost anyone can watch and enjoy. I say almost because besides there always being someone to hate on something, Heavenly Delusion does have a fair bit of fan service spread throughout it that might make some people uncomfortable watching, but I mean, come on, it's anime. You know the drill. By now, I feel like it's really a given that there might be something awkward in most series at some point in time, and some people really just need to learn to roll with those punches in that regard. I do hold this series though for right now in pretty high regard, I do want to see some things cleared up at the ending though, specifically in terms of Kiriko's character. I feel like the way things went down should provide a basis for their character as an individual to grow, and I can't lie, it would be rather disappointing if that situation they went through was only for shock value and didn't provide anything of substance, other than basically getting over Robin. Not to just hate on that moment happening or anything, because I do think sensitive media has a place in anything, TV, anime, whatever, but I do want to see it mean something. 
something. Though, with all that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, subscribe for more content like this. I'm looking to be more consistent with uploading. I say that all the time, but I mean it this time, surely. While also upgrading the general quality of the channel, so you won't want to miss where we go next. I hope to see you in another video. Thank you and goodbye.